our last presentation of the day. Uh, I don't know about you, but I have uh, spent most of, most of my life as a developer working on Unix machines, be it Linux or, or Mac OS, and Mike, careful with that. Um, and um, spent most of my time developing Python on those same platforms and have not spent a lot of development time working on Windows because everybody's told me that Windows is not particularly good for Python. Steve Dow works for Microsoft, and he works on Python for Windows, and he's going to tell us today about why Python on Windows is OK, actually. Please make Steve welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so I expect the first question that you're going to be asking yourselves is, why do I even care about this? Uh, because you're all at a conference, which means you look around, and you'll see something kind of like this. Granted, this is anecdotal data. Uh, I've been to PyCon a few times. I've done a rough count. And honestly, I am in the minority segment here, so maybe my view is a little biased. I've checked this with a few people. They kind of get the same feeling. And then you show up to a talk at one of these conferences, or you show up to a range of talks, and you see the same thing over and over again. And then you come into this room. <clears throat> Yeah. <laughs> but these are not real. So let's look at some real data. Here, I went to PyPI. All of the download data from PyPI is available online in Google BigQuery. I ran a range of queries, popular packages. Who's downloading them? It varied, but in general, it was this breakdown. Majority Linux, roughly equal Windows, Mac, depending on the package. It doesn't look at all like the previous graphs. If you look at downloads from Conda for their package repository, you see a bigger chunk of Windows than Mac. Mac is being slowly edged out here. You start looking at some of the editors and IDEs that people are using. Uh, oh, sorry, PSF survey first. PSF ran a survey last year. Running a survey again now. Go vote in that survey. Provide your details so we get more of this information. But 50% of the respondents for that survey were running on Windows. Editors, IDEs, VS Code has slightly over 50% of its users on Windows, despite being Microsoft's first and best cross-platform IDE. PyCharm, even more popular. We're up to about 70% of usage is on Windows. And then there's Python.org. Now, to be fair, this is the main source for Python on Windows, where people go to download and install it. And all you're really getting for Linux is the source distro there, which has not been built. Uh, and the Mac OS installers are woefully underrepresented, honestly. You should be using these installers. They're pretty good. But just to put in context, here is the absolute number of downloads represented by that blue chunk in one month. Python for Windows is being downloaded over 150 million times per year. So. No matter how you want to slice it, no matter how generous or conservative you want to be, it's fair to say, uh, and even factoring in data that I can't actually share with you, it's fair to say roughly 50% of Python usage is occurring on Windows. Those of us in the Python community, those of us coming to conferences, those of us writing blog posts, are somewhere over here. And this is what we see, and this is what we believe. And what this results in is a split. There is a gap within the Python community where a big chunk is physically and uh, completely separated from all the rest of us who are over on that side. I want to be clear. I'm not blaming conferences for this. This is most obvious in the people who don't come to conferences. But I don't want to blame the conferences. This is not their fault. Equally, if you feel like I'm saying this to you, let me be really clear. This is not your fault either. It's a whole range of things. There's a whole range of factors that make people feel like they aren't welcome at a conference, they aren't invited to a conference, they aren't being included in a community. And today I'm going to talk about part of the gap that you may have under your control. So again, this is not a complete solution I want to look at here. Python itself spans operating system boundaries really well. 
It works well on so many operating systems, including many that you've probably never heard of and you certainly don't have installed on any of the computers in your house. But when users come to the Python ecosystem, they rely on libraries. These libraries are the welcoming committee. And when these libraries are not working for all the platforms that Python supports, people walk away saying, maybe Python is not for me. Libraries are the things that are under your control. So in this session, I'm going to go through five big ideas, five questions. I'm going to tell you 10 assumptions, two, two per idea, that people commonly make, things that people give as a response, and they're all false. I'm going to give you five ways to make it right. One simple way for each of these questions that you can change the code that you're releasing, that you're sharing with people, to make it more inclusive, regardless of what operating system someone is working on. At the end, there'll be one simple checklist. You'll notice from that checklist that everything I recommend is actually best practice on all operating systems and will make all of your users happier, regardless of whether they're using the same OS as you or a different one. So everything that I talk about here is actually good, generic, uh, actionable information, regardless of who your target audience is. That will also just automatically be more inclusive of the huge, currently underserved uh, part of the Python community running on operating systems that do not look exactly like Ubuntu. How do I run Python? This comes up mostly in documentation. So if you don't have documentation, you can ignore this because you have a bigger problem. <laughs> but if you do have documentation, chances are your instructions on how to run your tool say, just type Python. This assumes that it's on path. So why is this not true? On most POSIX-based systems, path is the variable well, on all the systems I'm talking about. Path is the variable that tells the terminal where to find the program you want to run. On most POSIX-based systems, the commands that you're going to run will be in a, few, in a fairly simple hierarchy of locations. There's commands that the user has set up for themselves. There's site commands that have been put on by the distro, then there's system commands, and these are nice clean buckets that the commands go into in order to be run. Windows does not work like this. On Windows, path is used to specify where system variables, uh, system files are kept. So executables, dynamic libraries are on path. But you can modify path to put your own app there. And of course, so can someone else. Uh, and then, you know, someone gets a bonus because they're the most important app in the world, and so they go ahead and put themselves right at the top. And you'll notice what you have here is you don't have a clean bucket for commands that the user wants versus the machine. What you have is a bucket per application. And if your application has copies of system DLLs from, say, older versions of the operating system, and you are very clever and you put yours first, then the operating system is now loading old versions of system files. It does not like that. As soon as you start messing with the path on Windows, you're rolling a dice every time you try and load something. This is, in fact, why the Python installer no longer puts Python on the path, because it includes some of these files that can mess with all sorts of things. The second assumption that people make is that typing Python 3 will launch Python. <laughs> on Windows, it's called Python. It has a .exe. The .exe is optional but there's only ever one name. No matter what version is installed, it is a python.exe. And just to make things more fun, there's also a py command uh, that's secretly py.exe. This will also launch Python. OK, what's the difference here? Python.exe is a specific version of Python. So the, the POSIX equivalent, you type python 3.7, you get that specific version of Python. This is the equivalent of that. But back in POSIX, you type Python 3, you get a symlink that's going to get the latest version of 3 that the symlink was installed to point at, which is roughly the same problem that the path variable can have. PY on Windows will find the latest version of Python that's installed. No matter when it was installed, what order, it's going to locate it and run the correct one. Where does this break down? It breaks down because your script that is installed with your package does not use PY it uses the Python it was installed with. I'm going to use black as an example, uh, not because black does any of this wrong, just because it's a really cool formatter and you should go use it. So I'm going to say black over and over again just to plant the idea. 
When you pip install black, you get a command black. Because Python generally assumes that everything is on the path, you'd think typing black will find that command. OK, it doesn't always on Windows, because that's not such a great idea. But the second part is, if you do find that black command, it's going to run with a specific Python. It's not going to go through PY and find the latest version and run with that. It will run with where it was installed. What is the fix for this? The simple idea here is to use a not always known feature of Python. It's the dash M option. Python has normally the binary or the symlink followed by the script you want to run. Dash M imports a module. So it does exactly the same logic as if you'd started running Python, type import the name of the module, and then execute that module. So for example, typing Python dash M black is going to import and run black exactly the same as if you'd ran the script. The difference is you get to specify exactly what Python binary it runs with. So you can use py here on Windows. You can use py dash version dash M whatever module you want to run. You may have seen python dash M pip install pip is the recommended command there. That is because it's the most reliable way to know that when you run Python, you'll get the package that was installed by pip because it's run it with the exact binary. So it actually works best on all platforms. If you use Python and pip commands directly, no matter the platform, you may install the package in the wrong place, and then you can't find it later. So one simple idea, Python dash M, support it. It's very, very simple to support in your package. If you have an entry point script, this is a very small step from there, but also document it. It doesn't have to be the headline command in your readme, but somewhere there, just say, hey, you can also use Python dash M, my module, to run this script. How do I handle paths? So if you've done cross-platform development at all, then you'll be OK with this one. Everyone uses forward slashes. No, they don't. Granted, Windows is the biggest exception. Uh, on the other hand, it's the biggest exception. But it uses backslashes, which means as soon as you type something like this into your code, you have instantly made your script, your library, incompatible with Windows because there is not a single forward slash in that string. Now, you may think that they can work. Windows will, when given forward slashes, knows how to convert them to backslashes. But when it gives you back a path, it's never going to give you it with forward slashes. So that is an easy way to make your code not work for people who are trying to use it on a different platform. The other assumption that people make about paths is that they understand how to handle them, which is not true. OK, pop quiz. This is a root directory. Yeah? Is this a root directory? Yes, it is. This is also a root directory. This is not a root directory. This is a computer. Yes, this is a root directory. <laughs> is your split function going to correctly handle this as the root directory on your system? So one simple idea from pathlib import path. And again, this works great on every operating system. Pathlib provides an object-oriented model for managing file system paths. So it gives you operators for extending, for joining it. It gives you properties for retrieving specific parts of it or for reducing the length of it. There are functions for replacing parts of the names. Uh, there's some convenient file system functions. Glob is one that I use all the time. Uh, and you can also do path comparisons, which will transparently handle a lot of the case folding that needs to go on on various operating systems when you do that. Where do I keep my settings? A lot of people assume that the tilde is the home directory. This is not true. On Windows, the tilde is simply a character that can be part of a path which means if you, create, if you try and open something under the tilde, you have to create a directory called that, or it's going to create one for you, or you're simply going to end up with a file named tilde, which is probably not what you intended. The second part of that is that people assume that it's the best directory anyway. And I would really push back on that, because I, I 
use Linux, and if I ls in my home directory, then there's just dot .files everywhere, and that's not pleasant. But on Windows, it gets even more complicated. You have a user profile that's roughly the equivalent, and that contains user-visible folders, documents, pictures, videos. These are like front and center for users. They'll do clever things, like if you are synchronizing photos and videos from a camera that you plug in, Windows knows to put them there, because that's where you keep your pictures and your videos. But there's also application data folders in there as well. And again, these have different meanings. There's a local one for stuff that never leaves the physical machine you're on. There's roaming that's attached to your user profile that could show up on other machines when you go and log into them if you have a network configured for that. Which is the best directory to keep your settings in? There's actually no good answer. What there is is a very nice, uh, friendly licensed single file module called AppDurs which provides a handful of functions that basically switch based on operating system to choose this for you. So import apters will give you a collection of functions for, that will help you choose the folder transparently for user data, user configuration, user cache information. If you need to access machine-wide data, then it can specify folders for that as well. It takes out one decision point from something you have to worry about. It will store information in the correct place for all operating systems you run that it supports, uh, because I suspect there's a lot that it doesn't support. But it takes away, the pro takes away your need to choose where a user should be keeping their information, and it makes sure that it works properly for people regardless of where they are. What text encoding should I use? A lot of people start with the assumption that UTF-8 is always correct. Unsurprisingly, this is false, uh, but I want to explain why. You'd, you'd think that you know, in a good modern operating system, it makes sense to have Unicode throughout the entire operating system, that everything is represented in Unicode. So brief history lesson. What do you think was released in 1985? What do you think was released in 1991? 1985, we saw the first version of Windows 1.0. This shipped in, I don't know exactly how many countries, but it was more than, the, more than the number of countries that speak predominantly English or use predominantly Latin character sets. It shipped with internationalization support. 1991 was Unicode 1.0. So quite obviously, Windows was out before Unicode was out, and there's no way that the internals could support that. One of the other things about Windows, it is one of the most backwards compatible operating systems out there, which means that everything that worked in Windows 1.0 theoretically will continue working, and certainly at an API level, that's the case. Which is why Windows has two categories of APIs that involve text. So they're traditionally called the A APIs for ANSI and the W APIs for wide. These are suffixed on everything. You want to create a file, you want to rename a file, uh, anything involving text is going to have one of these extensions. One takes Chasta. It uses the code page. Now, the code page is how you get around the problem of having 256 possible characters and needing to support more of that. You have some global setting that says, this is how to interpret those numbers to be the right thing. That's the code page. If you pick up bits from one machine, put them on another machine that has a different code page, you get different text. The white chart ones are UTF-16. Why UTF-16? I don't know. I wasn't in the room when that was decided. But what you'll notice is that neither of these is UTF-8. So unfortunately, UTF-8 is always correct, is not the case. This has the most negatives on any of the slides. Bytes are not text, false. Bytes are text, except when they're not. So a common assumption that you'll see made on uh, made by developers who are targeting POSIX systems is that, oh, if I get bytes from the operating system and keep them as bytes, I can pass them around, and it's just a blob, and no one's ever going to change it, and everyone will know what they mean. Uh, and this is false. As I just said, Windows internally is using UTF-16. So while there are APIs that are available that are still using the code page, Internally, it's been converted to UTF-16, which means even if you pass in that char star array, those 8-bit characters, those are going to be converted through a lossy conversion into, or in fact, a lossless conversion into UTF-16 
but the result is going to be converted back through a potentially lossy conversion into the bytes you originally asked for, which means you can lose data even though you think you're using pure bytes. So one simple idea, use str, use a string. Yes, it was painful migrating from Python 2, but we're mostly there now. Apologies to those who aren't, but this is the reason why you want to move, because you can simply use str to represent paths and interact with the file system, interact with user data everywhere on every operating system, and Python can handle all of it. There's even edge cases on POSIX systems where bytes seem better that are correctly handled if you're using strings that are not possible to go the other way. One extra note I will add here, though, is when you're accessing user data, when you're reading from a file, when you're writing to a file, you must refuse the temptation to guess. I strongly recommend that whenever you open a file, you specify the encoding. And if you don't know the encoding, you need to ask. So if you have a function that is going to open a file, you need to provide an encoding parameter. Or you need to have some side channel to find out the encoding of that file. But you should not guess, because guessing is literally saying, I am happy to throw away your characters. I'm happy to throw away your language and simply replace it with question marks or whatever diamond-shaped box is going to replace it when I made the wrong guess. Don't we all want to know the answer to this? How do I make my code work? Especially when nobody can install on Windows, right? This is completely false at this point. So a number of things have come together to make this the case. Uh, but the people you hear saying nobody can install on Windows are literally talking about Python 2.7 from more than five years ago. What's happened since then? As of Python 3.5, the installer was changed to no longer require administrator privileges, which means anyone can install Python on Windows. As of 3.7, it's been improved even further to make that the case. Uh, earlier in, I forget the exact year, and I should have reminded myself of this before getting up here, uh, we started shipping wheels. So a few people have talked about the wheel format. Originally, that was on PyPI for Windows. You couldn't upload wheels for other platforms. But what that meant is that People could build packages and have them be installed on Windows and, and take away one of the biggest pain points that users suffer. Windows is one of the only operating systems that does not ship with a compiler ready there. The reason is, most of the time, you don't need it. Most people don't need it. It's relatively easy to get if you know how. But instead, we made it so Python users don't need it. This is, this, is, <clears throat> this is a slide where things get a little harder for me, because I, not only is this false, this is just wrong. You can test on Windows. You don't want to. <laughs> you absolutely can. And you know how I know you can? Because half of the crowd on that slide earlier is testing your code on Windows, and it's failing. So you don't actually have an excuse for this. There are plenty of ways that you can test your code on Windows. If you don't want to, that's fine. You can say up front, I don't care about 50% of the Python community, and so I'm just not even going to worry about them. But that is your choice. That is not something that's been forced on you. So you get two simple ideas for this one, because I'm feeling generous. Either get continuous integration or get collaborators. There are so many free CI systems out there that will build your code for you, that will run your tests for you on every platform. Azure Pipelines is one that I know well. I'm happy to talk to you about afterwards. Windows, Mac, Linux builds, free 10 concurrent jobs, no uh, monthly limits for open source projects. You don't have an excuse for not having access to the machine. We're giving it to you. Equally, there are many Python users with Windows, many, many of them. But they use your code and go, it doesn't work, I'll walk away. When instead, you could have a comment there saying, I have not tested this on Windows, but I would love it if someone could and give me feedback, here's how to reach out to me. People will. 
people will. It's not hard to invite your users to work with you on a project. It's not hard to invite someone to run your tests on an occasional basis, make sure they're still fine, even to build a wheel for you when it comes time to release. So where do we go from here? I promised a checklist. If you're going to take something home with you, this is it. Ask yourself, next time you have a project ready to release, does dash M work on my project? Do I manipulate paths by hand or string methods instead of path methods? Do I put configuration in weird places? Do I keep text in non-string types? Do I have continuous integration? Do I have collaborators? I just find this so sad and embarrassing that there are so many Windows users of Python out there. I know many of them. I get to see more of them than most people do. And it's so sad that they're out there. There's many factors feeding into this. There's many reasons why they feel like they can't be here. They can't be participating in our community. But I hope that with a few simple things that we can do in our libraries, we can reduce that gap and start expanding our uh, community that we see and engage with to include all of Python's users. My name is Steve Dower. I'm a Python engineer at Microsoft. Thank you very much.